is. Take your Bibles and turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to be in quite a few different scriptures tonight. And uh, just be pre prepared to turn. You guys don't mind that, do you? No. So tonight we're going to begin what should be a relatively short series. And uh, while the series is going to focus on a single word, it's a word that is uh, less and less commonly but in, and vaguely used to describe a whole lot of very, very important spiritual disciplines, things that we as Christians definitely need to have under, under control. And so the purpose of this series is to answer the question, how should Christians relate to the term class? Especially as it's used to define and describe where and how we fit in this present world and in the world that is to come. Let me say that again. We're focusing on the word class. As in that person is classy or that person has class or classification. How should Christians relate to that term as it is used to define and describe where and how we fit in this present world and in the world to come. Now, we're going to use our old um, format, the what is it, how do we get it, what do we do with it. But before we get into that, we're going to start tonight with asking the question, why? What's the point? Why should we bother with this? And there are several different um, answers to that. We're going to focus on two main answers, and the first is very simply that we need a new, one, new battery. But anyway, the first one is that Christians should always be concerned with how God would classify our classify us, classify our performance. Amen. Pretty simple. Second Corinthians chapter five. Let's begin reading verse number nine. Second Corinthians five nine says, "Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, here in the body, we may be accepted of Him." For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You know, in this non-judgmental world that we think we live in, people don't like to think about the fact that God classifies people. God judges people. Either saved or you're unsaved, right? All people are classified into one of two categories. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12 says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So there is no in-between, <clears throat> despite what a lot of different religions want to teach. Either forgiven or you're unforgiven. Either a child of God or a child of the devil. It's one of those two classifications. Do we believe that? Amen. Among those who are saved which I would hope is us. God still classifies us. Faithful, unfaithful. Holy, unholy. Obedient, disobedient. Mature, immature. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. We know that, right? Search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Flip back to Matthew chapter 13. I'll flip forward, I guess I should say. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 23. We're asking the question, and we're investigating the claim that God classifies people into different groups. But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, so save people, right? Understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. And bringeth forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. See those classifications? Now that doesn't make you uncomfortable. Does it? God expects us to bear fruit. Obviously through the Spirit that we get in Galatians 5. But God also expects us to reproduce ourselves. That we should lead other people to Christ. Where would you fit in that? 30-fold, 60-fold. What was the bottom number? <laughs> 30. Yeah, I mean, think about that. How many people have you led to the Lord? 
as I was preparing for this, I had to ask myself a question. Not only am I saved, but I'm a pastor. How many people are in ministry that I've trained? And there's a couple, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm at the 30-fold level yet. This is challenging to me. So, again, when we're thinking about this concept of, of being, nobody likes the idea of being measured or checked or, or classified, right? But can we trust God? Amen. He loves us, right? Yes. He's not going to misclassify us. If God puts us in a specific category, if God's word would relegate us to a specific category, then we deserve it. Amen? Isaac, do me a favor. Fill it up with water. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't, wasn't prepared. So, why should we be interested in this topic? The first is, we're going to stand before God and give an account. And when we give that account, there is an eternal reward. There are eternal consequences. We need to understand, the, the, again, the Bible is very, very clear, that there is an economy in eternity. We're not going to sit around on clouds with harps and halos and, and waste time all day. We're not going to just sit around the throne of God and just sing for an eternity. We'll have jobs. The world in eternity, eternity will probably be a lot like what the earth perfect, perfect would be like. We read Revelation and we hear about nations coming in and out of the city of God. And, and there, there's, there, you will fit somewhere. You'll have a job. And where you fit in eternity will be based on your faithfulness here. And, and again, this is a whole other sermon. Thank you so much. This is a whole other sermon. But I wonder, and every once in a while I try to imagine, because there's only so much God's Word tells us about the facts of it. What could we be giving up? in eternity by choosing to be less faithful than we could now. Well, I'll give God this much, but ugh, I don't want to give Him too much because I might not be able to live as well as I want to live here and now. For this infinitesimal speck that we call life compared to eternity. Is that logical? Does that make sense? That's foolish. That, that, that's like, have you ever done this with kids? I'll give you this M&M, or I'll give you this $10 bill. Which would you rather have? And the kid snatches up the M&M. Because they're oblivious to... Andrew's like, what? I was never there. <laughs> and Andrew was, was six months old. Give me the money. We were giving Abby a hard time. She, when, we, when she was really young, she found a money order for like $400. And when we found her, it was all like, it was like tobacco. All just in her mouth. Blue dripping down the side of her face. Anyway, you just tell her I said that. Anyway, so why should we be concerned about class? Because God is. Number two, we as Christians need to be very aware. Yeah, Ryan, if, if I do this, hit it. <laughs> so we need to be aware, aware of, and very careful about the extent to which, there's that phrase again, we allow the world, the flesh, and the devil to define, dictate, and direct the way we think and feel about our own identity. Let it sink in. To what extent are we allowing the world, the flesh, or the devil to determine what we think about our own identity? And we need to be prepared. We need to be ready to combat the worldliness in ourselves and the worldliness that we see growing up in our, the people that we're responsible for. Amen? Amen. Flip back to Colossians chapter 2. We'll look at two different scriptures here. Colossians chapter 2. Read verses 6 through 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord... So walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after, after the tradition of men, 
after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. If you've been coming to our uh, study on Sunday night, this is one of the foundational texts that we use there. Be don't let people spoil you or damage you or destroy you by causing you to define yourself or to define your culture or to define what the church is or what a Christian... Have you ever had someone tell you, well, you're a Christian, you ought not do that? Like they're trying to tell you what you should be even though they're lost as Job's turkey? I don't even know what that means, but I've heard it over again. Does that ever bother you? You know... I've used this illustration too many times, but it, it, it fits. I remember a young man, new Christian, coming to me saying, I can't be a Christian anymore. Why? It's the sex. What? Well, my wife told me that Christians don't do that. We can't do that anymore because we're saved now. So I had the privilege of opening my Bible and helping him understand how he could better lead his wife. <laughs> It's because she was selfish and foolish and counted on him to not allow God to lead him. Does the world do that to us? Well, Christians can't have money. Christians can't be fit. Christians can't have fun. You know, people throw all sorts of foolish things out like that. You know, I was listening to uh, an old tape uh, it was about how to determine God's will. And there was a portion of it that basically, the preacher was basically saying this. If it's something you would like, don't do it. If you're trying to find God's will, and there's this car over here that really appeals to you, or there's this car over here that would be more economical, well, just go with the economical one, because, you know, you don't want to follow the lusts of the flesh. <laughs> If you could buy a red car or a blue car, which one do you like better? Well, I like red. Get the blue one. That's what a Christian does. Deny the flesh. That's stupidity. And that's a recipe for failing to, be, to find fulfillment in God. By the way, it's very arrogant for someone to suggest, to speak for God in such a way that is outside of what the Bible says. I'm off my notes. I better get back. That's a, that's a big deal, though. That's important. Read what the Old Testament said about prophets who do that. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look forward to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look at verse 5. Well, let's read verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Why should we be concerned about class? The Bible says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means worldly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You following? Why should we think about what the Bible has to say as opposed to what the world has to say about who, what, where, and how we're supposed to be, and where we fit into this world, and where we fit into the next world. Because you have an enemy that wants to put you down, and keep you down. So, let's. are you ready for some controversy? You all like controversy, right? I hope that you all are mature enough that this isn't too controversial. There is a false lying sentiment that is spreading like cancer <clears throat> through not only our nation, but even within the church. Next slide. It's the, the lie that all people, all ideas, all cultures are equal. We're all equal. Next one. You might remember in a series we did not, well, last year sometime, I, I said that some of the devil's greatest masterpieces use truth to manipulate people into false conclusions. Simple example, you failed, thus you are a failure. Well, one, it may be true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the next one is true. But have you ever believed that lie? 
where you failed in something, you say, I am a failure. Now, it is true that all men are created equal. That's true in the sense that we're all created in the image of God. We were all bought with the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. It is also true that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. You're not more saved than someone else. When you get saved, it is you are born again. And much like a, a baby coming into the world, there, there's potential. And I, I want to pause for a second, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want you to think about that infant. If you judge after the world, if you judge in a carnal or fleshly way, you might look at their parents, you might look at the child itself, and some of you have uh, I've put him up here before, Nick Vujicic, no arms, no legs, a child born that way, and then you might compare that child to another child of Christian parents, healthy, happy, smart baby, your Apgar scores are tens. And if you judge after the world, you might think that one child has more potential than the other. I'm going to tell you straight. Nick Vujicic contributes far more to the kingdom than a lot of pastors I know who have arms and legs and more education than he does. So we need to be careful about how we go about judging. And we need to remember it's what really matters is how God would classify It's also true that God created us different. Amen? Aren't you glad about that? Amen. And within that difference, there is different potential. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. I told you to be in several different scriptures tonight. Let's look at verse 28. Because I want to establish this sort of universal... Uh, Equality of humanity and equality of salvation in Christians. Galatians chapter 3, let's look at verse 28 where the Bible says this. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ, you're a child of God. Amen. Level at the foot of the cross. And the Apostle Paul was trying to get across to this very sexist society, male-dominated, I mean, women's, uh, women didn't even count as far as their testimony in court, That's, they didn't own property, but the Jews thought of themselves as above everyone else, like the Lord had over everyone else, and the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles is saying, listen, Jews, people of God, Lord just changed things through the cross. Amen? Amen? Opened the door for everyone to come to Christ, not through Judaism, but to come directly to Christ. Amen? Amen? And that all these classifications that the world had put on things, Jesus destroyed. Praise the Lord for that. Amen? Now, it's also true that God created us to fulfill various functions within the group. We have different talents. We have different abilities. We have different, different uh, gifts and calling. Amen? Aren't you glad about that? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If everyone were the eye, if everyone were the foot, can the eye look at the, at the mouth or the ear and say, I don't need you? So the Bible is trying to say that even within the body of Christ, there is variety, there is difference, and we need to avoid this tendency that we have to say, well, I'm more important than you. Amen? So far, we like all this, right? Let me ask you a question. Is your gallbladder as important as your heart? You can live without a gallbladder. Think about that. I'm not saying that the gallbladder is not important. Is your pinky finger important? Yes, it is important. 
I'd like to keep mine. Is it as important as your brain? No. Now, hang on a second. Do all men, so all men are created equal. They start equal. Do all men stay equal? Hang on, folks. See, we are all created equal. We start made in the image of God. But as we begin to grow, or not grow, things tend to change, don't they? Are all, do all men grow up to be equally honorable in the sight of God and men? <laughs> Clearly not. Do all men grow up to serve the kingdom, serve their family, serve their culture, serve their whatever, in, at the same level? Not even close. And anyone who says that is so deluded by this leftist, socialistic garbage that they can't see the reality right in front of them. Amen? Amen. Are all ideas, are all views equal? Isn't this popular in America? Everyone has a right to your view. Everyone has a right to your opinion. Everyone, ha everyone has a, a right to their truth. Speak your truth. Well, let's see. Liberty or tyranny? Are those equal? No. Not even close. Let's compare something like feminism to Christianity. Are those two competing ideas even close in value? How about environmentalism versus Christianity? Are they anywhere close? No. And yet there's this mentality. And we live in a society full of people who would, would proudly, arrogantly, I mean, they would really feel balanced and refined and evolved to look at a Satanist and a Christian and say, you both have your own truth. Why can't we just get along? Why can't you recognize the value and, and respect this, that, and the other? And the... Except one belief says, lie, cheat, steal, kill, do whatever you have to do to get your way. It is your evolutionary duty to crush the weak. So that the species and the strong of the species survives and grows stronger. Christians say sacrifice. In our study uh, Sunday night, talking about evolution. Imagine how... Uh, he used the, the uh, illustration of a lion cub. If a lion cub walked up to the kill that his mom had made and looked at the zebra and went, Oh, I can't. I feel bad for the zebra. Is the lion going to evolve and do well? No, he's going to die. He's going to starve. But that's an animal. That's not a person. But that's Satanism, not Christianity. So this idea that all religions and all views, they're all equal, that is garbage. It's garbage. And it's the enemy trying to lump you in with all of his garbage. And far too many Christians go along with it. Men who once stood for something, men who made powerful impacts for the kingdom fell. You guys know I've read uh, I Purpose Driven Church. We, do, we use a lot of the principles, truths that, that Rick Warren pointed out in that, in that book. But Rick Warren today is, today is one of the driving people behind Chrislam. Combining Christianity and Islam. That's garbage. Amen. You're diametrically opposed. Why? It shows that when you are more concerned with being classified favorably by the world than by God, what happens? You step off the rock and you sink. God can't use you. And you start doing damage. Are all cultures equal in class, honor, and value? Now pause before you answer that. There's a difference between an ethnic group, an ethnicity, a nation, 
and a culture. <coughs> and ethnicity is, is a nationality. I am American. I am Mexican. I am North Korean. I am Iranian. A culture. Are there different cultures within America? If you travel at all, you will understand the answer is yes. Is there a difference between someone who lives in New York and someone who lives in Tennessee or Alabama? Yes. Those are different cultures. And there are, there are subcultures within those cultures. Yes? I mean, even in our own little county, are there different cultures of people? Are all of those cultures within those ethnicities equal in value? The answer is no. No, no, no. Does Iran, North Korea, and Belarus contribute to the welfare of the world in the same way that Switzerland, the UK, and, or the US does? It's not a debate. There are facts. You, you can see clearly that some countries contribute more to the welfare of the world than other countries. No two ways about it. But do you as an American ever get frustrated at the billions upon billions of dollars that are taken from you, or more accurately, that are borrowed in your name and against your kid's life, and sent to countries like Iran? Amen. Does it bother you that President that, that, uh, Obama gave Iran $100 million, and then all of a sudden, magically, North Korea has ballistic missiles that are nuclear capable. Capa Does that bother you? There is good and there is bad. And the, there is no nation that has ever contributed to the kingdom like America did. Ever. And yet, how popular are we in the, in the UN right now? Not at all. I remember growing up in the Philippines and having arrogant young Filipinos, not the older Filipinos who remember the war, when we rescued them from Japan, but the younger Filipinos saying, we don't need you. We don't want you on our soil. We, want you. we don't want you. We don't need your business. We don't need your tourism. Go away. And it wasn't a year after Clark Air Base pulled, pulled out, they were begging. Begging. You know why? Because the Japanese, the Australians, the Chinese, they weren't interested in, in throwing money around like we were. Okay, got to get back to my notes. I want to make sure we get this. Go ahead, next one. I believe that in Christ, that within the light of truth, all ethnic groups, all nations, possess similar, if not identical, if not equal, not identical, but equal, potential. But it is undeniably true that even different cultures within various ethnic groups demonstrate vastly different levels of class, of honor, of value. And it's based on the extent to which these cultures accept and apply the truth. This is, this is simple and easy, is it not? And so, to end sort of this, so often Christians today are, are accused of being bigoted and, and, and racist and homophobic and sexist and all of these things. Listen, whether you're man or woman, boy, girl, no matter what culture you come from, do we care? Red and yellow, black and white, brown, who cares? They are precious in His sight. Amen. And it does not matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your mom or your daddy did or didn't do. In Christ, you have, all people have the potential to move the ball down the field for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. That is what real Christians believe. That is not what the world believes, is it? You know what the psychological term projection is? Somebody tell me what that is. Anybody know? Projection. You take your thoughts, your ideas, and project them, 
your view of the world and project it onto someone else, assuming that their views are what you believe their views are. Right. And mo most often this is done in projecting your shortcomings, your weaknesses. Have you ever noticed when you look at the left-right paradigm in America that the right or the conservative side is accused of the very thing that the left is actually doing? And what you, you said this, so we think that you meant this. Yeah, but you actually did this. That's projection. And that is textbook maneuver of the devil. By the way, we need to be careful to make sure we don't do that. Amen? Amen. As we get into this, one of the things we're going to talk about and how you define class is to be able to accept the truth, to recognize the truth. Not what you want or not what you hope and dream, but the way it really is. The left can't do that. The world doesn't do that. Now, so again, I hope that what that little sentence, that little phrase that we just went through, shows that I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I'm not a bigot, but I'm your pastor. And I love you. And I have a responsibility to address the things that weaken this church, that weaken you. Amen? Ready? 2 Timothy, chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's read verse, read verse 20 and uh, 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, God has a great house, amen? amen. There are not only vessels or tools, utensils of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If, therefore, if a man therefore purge himself from these, talking about the sin before and after these verses, he should be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, that means clean, set apart. And meat, that means appropriate for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Let those verses sink in for a second. In rural... In a rural American church like us, like you, like me, we love the idea that God is just as happy with a wooden spoon as he is with a silver or stainless steel spoon. Right? We like that idea. That God is just as happy with Isaac taking a, 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 a knife and a piece of sandpaper, carving himself out a spoon and saying, Look, Mom, a spoon! With all its splinters. And no sanitation at all. Pulled out of the yard. Carved up. Bless God. It's a vessel for the Master's use. And we like that idea. That it's just as good as a stainless steel spoon. But is that the way God would classify things? Obviously, he can and often does, does use a wooden spoon. My mom used a wooden spoon all the time. Sometimes that's the best tool for the job, amen? Sometimes you need a big plastic spoon, big old ladle. All kinds of different spoons, yes? Let me ask you, which one is easier to keep bacteria off of and out of? You know, when um, I can't smell, I'm not the most conscientious of those things. And so I remember my grandmother telling my aunt when I moved in with her, she said, you got to clean out your fridge because Brian doesn't care. He'll just eat it. He'll be two, year, two weeks old. He won't smell. He'll just eat it. And you got to wash things. He'll pull it out of the sink, wipe it off, and use it. you got to keep things clean or Brian will die of sickness. It's the truth. Because we think immaturely. We don't, we don't recognize dangers. 
a wooden spoon, if left in the sink in water? See, some of you really get it. Some of you are grimacing. Some of you are like me, and, and like Isaac's going, huh? Wipe it off, use it. That's not how God thinks about things. There's a reason that they make spoons out of stainless steel. Because they're easier to keep clean. They are resistant. Hello, I'm preaching up here. They're resistant to stain. They're resistant to disease. They're resistant to contamination. They're a better tool. Amen? Amen. So, in rural America, where we like the idea of carving our, a spoon out and being self-sufficient, and God will just take the widow's might. Right? God will just take whatever I am and however I am, and bless God, He'll just use me such as I am. And then when a sp stainless spoon comes around, we go, they think they're something. With their education and whatnot. They think they're something. Look at him, he's got a polo shirt on. <laughs> he's wearing a tie and a jacket. He must think he's something. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. What should we aspire to be? You know... I've got a book in my life, it's called The Corinthian Catastrophe. And in it, the, the author talks about the, the problem that Paul, the Apostle Paul, had to address in Corinth. You see, the church of Corinth saw people speaking in tongues, healing, doing all sorts of impressive things. And rather than follow God and seek to edify the church and glorify God, people said, ooh, I'd like to speak in tongues. Ooh, I want to heal. Ooh, I want to I want to prophesy. Next thing you know, you had 20 different women wanting to preach every week at their husbands. I added that in. And that's when Paul had to write a letter and say, "Whoa, wait a minute." And in that letter he said, "Covet earnestly the best gifts." And he wasn't talking about healing. He wasn't talking about tongues. He was talking about preaching and teaching the truth. He was talking about humbling yourself and simply serving people, like Jesus has said. And that's greatest, let him be your servant, let him be your minister. Don't let your right, right hand know what your left hand is doing. Just be quiet, don't draw attention to yourself, and just serve God. See what I'm getting at? We want to believe, and we'll go another step further here. thought that guy would make the right expression. Hang on a second. I'm not trying to insult anybody. But we want to believe that God is just as happy with the man cleaning the toilet as he is with the woman teaching the Sunday school class. It is true that God is more pleased with a man cleaning a toilet with a right attitude and a worshipful heart than a person preaching a sermon for their own glory. Yes? However, think logically. Which is God more pleased with? What moves the ball farther down the field? If Kyle washes the toilet... Or if Kyle leads his friend to Christ, which moves the ball farther down the field? Duh. Right? A lost person could mow the church grass, yes? Could a lost person really share from the heart the truth? Uh -uh. Could a lost person shine the light of the gospel, shine the light of the Holy Spirit? No. We could hire a lost, group of lost people to clean this place. Yeah. And so when it comes to classification, not for our glory, not for look at me, but I'm warning the church about this lukewarm mentality, this loser, low-class mentality that 
thinks that we can compare our lukewarm service to someone else's sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, the author references Cain and Abel. Remember that story? Who thought that they had worked harder for, to make their sacrifice? Who thought that they deserved God's praise and honor? What was Somebody tell me, what was the simple difference between and the reason why God honored one and didn't honor the other? What's the, what's the answer to that question? He wanted, he wanted the meat sacrifice. He wanted the first, the best. Abel did what God told him to do. Right. Cain did what he thought he should do. Cain <clears throat> said, surely God will be impressed with all of this stuff that I'm doing. And certainly everyone else will be impressed with this gigantic mound of stuff. Look at all that I've done. Abel just did what God said. Humbly. Just simply. Again, going back to the widow's might. We like to go back to that and say, oh, look, God was happy. That widow and her might. All right, so you give the same percentage that she gave. Because how much, what percentage did she give? A hundred percent. So you give a hundred percent and then you can feel that way. But that's not what we do, is it? You see how we play games? And we classify according to the flesh. We classify according to what makes us feel good, or what we think is going to impress others. You're not fooling God. We're going to talk more about the dangers and uh, the dangers of comparison. As we, as we go through this study, we're going to talk about some of the dangers of comparison. We're going to talk about some of the dangers when we go about trying to honestly classify ourselves and others, and there are some legitimate dangers. Pride, greed. I'll give you just a, a personal example, and I need to go fast. Um, I remember going to a church, and I was blown away by the extent to which this church performs, it, it, at the level at which, this, at which this church performed. And I invited a pastor friend of mine to go. And... At the, as we were driving away, I was like, what would you think? I wasn't very impressed. Really? He said, that man couldn't pastor two seconds in my town. It was insecurity. It was pride. It was arrogance. It was not the truth. You see... When a low-class person sees someone performing better than they, they start finding fault. Their fear, their insecurity, their low class is displayed. When a high-class person, when an honorable person sees someone perform better than them, they're inspired. They're humbled. And they're inspired. And they go into think mode. It's, how did you do that? How can I improve? We talk about class. We're going to play around. We're going to try and make things fun and funny. I don't want you to think that I'm trying to refine and, and you know, when you think of class, you hear classical music and white tie. and No. That's not what we're talking about. That's not where we're going. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but... When it's all said and done, folks, we've got to recognize the enemy is so good at getting us to classify ourselves in a way that does not honor God and does not help us. When it's all said and done, be not wise in my own eyes. Be the Lord, depart from evil. Questions, thoughts, comments before we get into our prayer time? I didn't offend anybody too gravely, did I? wouldn't admit it if I did. Does this resonate?